guys are getting fired up. See, there is proof that you can get excited over something other than a Chiefs Super Bowl. Amen. See, Roger, I made it. It came out of the closet one more time, buddy. Amen. I wore my Chiefs shirt. Oh, my goodness. I should have my Colts stuff on, but the Colts aren't in the Super Bowl, Brownie, so that's just the way it goes. Buddy. Go Chiefs. Go Chiefs. We're going to be in Galatians chapter number one. Thank you, praise team and musicians. I love how uh, um, when you uh, get a little victory in Jesus with a little bit of pizzazz, a little bit of... And everybody got all fired up in that. Even Bill was over here. He was jamming a little bit. And I said, oh, gosh. And then how great that, oh, my goodness, that was good. So you can get excited about singing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so now you're free. You're free to live faith in the Chiefs game today, too. There you go. And now, if some of you get a little more excited at that game, I don't know. Well, I know you will. You'll get excited. But that was really, really good. Great praise. Great worship. Exciting to see Barbara. Barbara, how are those eyeballs? Do I look? Oh, praise the Lord. That's enough for anybody. Oh, my gosh. Two of me is bad. <laughs> Do I look any better? No. Nah. <laughs> You're too kind. <laughs> We're going to be in Galatians chapter number one. We might wander over to Acts here as well in a moment. But um, thank you for some of you praying for me. I, I just been having a little bit of sinus stuff and just normal stuff and uh, regular life. I thank God that I had a little bit of a Sunday reprieve last Sunday. Randy Adams did just a tremendous job of reporting what our church has the privilege and honor to be part of was that not just God's grace story last week and all the different missionaries and I think he covered uh, like uh, 18 out of the 30 and so uh, gosh there's so much more to cover but I thank the Lord for our mission support team who of course came up with the thought we prayed through and thought okay let's do something like this put missions before the whole church on a Sunday instead of just on some Wednesdays where I know some of you can't make Wednesday services and and so it was really effective and we're looking forward to May and and we're looking forward to doing something like that putting Randy before all of you more often so uh, thank you for responding and thank you for being all in on missions church it's great to give to missions it's great to pray for missions by the way they're still praying every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. right Bobby 745 and they get on zoom and uh, they're ready to go so please text uh, uh, Randy uh, Facebook message whatever and let him know that you'd like to join the zoom prayer meeting that's going on for our missionaries every single Sunday and if you're bored men it's 7 o'clock on Saturday mornings we're here we're here to pray, and we've decided that we're going to be praying as a, as a bunch of men, and uh, we're not going to stop. And it's part of our Acts 2 project commitment to be a praying people even more so. I know a lot of you are always praying, praying at home, but we gather together as men on, uh, on Saturday mornings now. We're going to be having a, a men's conference in a few weeks. Make sure you set away time. We're going to be talking about prayer. It's going to be good. Abba Father, out of Mark 14, we're looking forward to that. So... Back to Galatians chapter number one. Of course, we started out here as our, our series, the first series of the year. And uh, let me read with you just the first five verses, which will give you a context for where we were two weeks ago. And then we're going to cover six through ten today in our message. Paul, an apostle, verse number one, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me, unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now keep in mind, a couple weeks ago, Paul started out our series for us. We kind of hitched on to his Holy Spirit writings, and we talked about his authority. 
authority in Jesus and Jesus alone. That's how you and I have any type of authority. And Paul wanted to make sure and make that clear. Because a lot of times we'll make some kind of great profound statement and then we'll want to take the glory for it. Or somebody will say, wow, that was really sounded quite, quite godly. And, and you just, how about... Hey, I have authority. My authority is in the Lord Jesus Christ. If I'm going to be discipling, if I'm going to be teaching, if I'm going to be investing, if I'm going to be in ministry, if I'm going to be sharing the gospel, the authority comes from the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. Well, the next few verses this morning are going to talk a little bit about something different, though it has still a lot to do with authority. It's the authority of the gospel. See, Paul the Apostle knew that there was a, a bad message going on here. In fact, it was a conflict, and we talked about that in the introduction to this series a couple of weeks back, and how there was, why, why they were addressed, the churches of Galatia, is because there was a conflict over the gospel, over Paul's authority, over the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is a corrective letter. Remember, Galatians is a companion book to, to Romans that has such solid, powerful doctrine on salvation, of course, by grace, but... Paul's covering in this book service by grace, that you are to serve the Lord by grace. You don't serve and do a bunch of goody-goody things just because you want to earn favor from God. And so Galatians is a corrective book on how to live your faith right. Now, let me ask you a couple simple questions. And as I am, wander over to Acts chapter number 14 with me, where we were reminded of the birth of this church. I mean, these churches in Derby and Iconium and such. What can happen to the Christian life if those things that were solid are now unsettled? You say, what do you mean? Well, it's all around us. There's conflict over theology. Conflict over proper biblical doctrine there is stuff that's going on today that will unsettle you unearth you pull the rug right out from underneath you and you, you don't know what you believe you can be in trouble you'll say boy that sounded really really good I listened to a blog I listened to a guy's message I listened to this person I listened to that person I was sitting in on a little bit of a round table and I, I went wow that sounded so good but you start having your foundation in Jesus Christ unsettled. The Corinthian people were warned by Paul. They had some settling issues, especially over the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ because some were of Cephas, of Paul's. They just were mixing everything up. Everybody needed to be of the Lord Jesus Christ. What can happen to the Christian life if those things that were solid are now settled? It says in Colossians chapter number 2, beware. Colossians 2 a beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the root, excuse me, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. There is warnings throughout your New Testament about the things that can happen. You get tossed to and fro with every window doctrine. Well, discipleship's the answer. A lot of people that have been discipled that are solid in the word are unsettled in what they believe today. I'm really concerned about that. Well, let me ask you another question then, because we don't want any unsettling or anything. So what would the legalistic Christians say? Well, they have a handle on it here. They have an answer. They say, a legalistic Christian would say, well, that's our liberty in Christ. Since you've got that liberty in Christ, that's what's causing you to have all your problems with being unsettled. No. No, you see, this church was founded on the grace of God. This was... This church was founded on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This church was founded on the grace of Jesus Christ. And it didn't need to be brought back into a place of legalism, in a place of law, in a place of saying, okay, now that you have a little bit of grace going on, pull that grace out and let's get into the law again and follow the law of Moses. Go back to, of course, as you have already made it maybe, Acts 14. <coughs> Look at verse number I believe it up there, verse number 19, thank you. And there came thither Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up, came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. 
And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many and returned again to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch and confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. These churches, Derby, Iconium, Lystra, they're the churches of Galatia that are being written to in Galatians chapter number 1. These are the churches that are being told, hey, you're saved, you're born again. Paul the Apostle brought the grace of salvation to them. Hey, now there's a church plant. There's a bunch of church plants here. Oh, by the way, verse number 1 of chapter number 15 reminds you from our intro back a couple weeks ago, again, as I said earlier, that there's a conflict. And certain men which came down from Judea, the Judaizers, taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Whoa, whoa, time out here. Time out. Remember how this church all started? It started on the gospel of grace. Churches of Galatia, Derby, Lystra, Iconium. Hey, everything's set in place. Boom. Chapter number 15, verse number 1, Paul having to contend with the faith, contend for the faith with his brothers who are saying, wait a minute here. You, if you're not really after the circumcision of Moses, you're not really saved. Again, be reminded that Romans focused on salvation by grace. Galatians is focusing on service by grace. And you can see how when you get twisted up in all of this, how, of course, the perversion of the gospel can make you go, wait a minute, how can that ever happen? Go back to Galatians chapter number one with me. Let's look at this and see, because here we are in a place Early church times, right? Early church. And yet, we live in a similar type of time. We live in a similar time where people are unsettled. People are being tossed to and fro more easily than ever. You say, well, I, hey, I've been discipled. I've gone through all of that stuff. Really? Have you forgotten then the way you're supposed to live every day? You know our theme verse? Galatians 2.20, it says up on the screen, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave his, himself for me. Do you live that way each day? Do you look at each day and going, that's the way I'm going to live? How do you start your day? How do you walk through your day? How is your day getting so unsettled according to to this rotten world making you believe things that are totally contradictory to the Word of God. It's because you don't spend the time in the Bible that you need to. You don't have somebody alongside of you answering you questions. You're not being discipled or having to be talked through things. And then everything sounds wonderful. Well, not everything is so wonderful. Just because someone can say it so well doesn't mean it's exactly the way it really says it in the Bible. In fact, don't be so fooled to think that you cannot be fooled. Watch what Paul has to say in Galatians chapter number 1, verse number 6. He says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He was just there, made a first trip, goes back to Antioch to report how things are going. Now he's moving on in the second trip. He's writing a letter between 51 and 58 AD and he's saying, I cannot believe. But I can't believe. <coughs> I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the law of Christ. No, it's the grace of Christ unto another gospel. What's the another gospel? Look at verse number 7. These two words come up here that are bothersome. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you. And would pervert the gospel of Christ. Trouble and pervert the gospel of Christ. Verse 8 and 9. Power pack 
strong, double-dose warning. But though we or any angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. God is pretty serious about you messing with his word. And then Paul goes on in verse number 10 and says, this is why I'm here. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Wow. You know, Paul sometimes in some of his letters starts out and he writes some nice greetings and some nice little fluffy words and he gives them some accolades and some props and he gets right into it here. Bam! Let me just give you a smack upside the head. Wake up! I think Frank Brown Sr. wrote this one. I don't know. That would be where my father would be. He's like, hey, wake up! You're not so settled like you used to be. Hey, remember I taught you how to do this? And I taught you how to do that, and I taught you how to do this. Isn't it amazing how hard you work to get something set and put in place? You get everything exactly the way you want it, and it takes about five minutes for the kids to turn it upside down. How is that? You work day after day, week after week, getting the house perfectly the way it needs to be. It's all settled, right? It's all set. Right, guys? You, you clean your houses all the time, right, guys? Okay, ladies. Ladies, let me talk to you. You clean your houses, you put it all in order, you got everything the way you just want it, on the shelves, everything in place, the kitchen, everything's set. You come back one day later, it looks like a tornado went off in your kitchen. <coughs> Wait till your house gets turned upside down from your Super Bowl party today. And tell Fauci, stuff it, we're going to have parties. Come on, let's go. Yeah, I said it, it's on YouTube, don't worry about it. Have a party. Wear a mask and have a party. I don't know. Have some Rotella and some dip. I don't know what you're going to do. Hey, whatever you want to do. Go chicken wings. <laughs> but here's it. Here's the it. As Christians, we really think we're settled in some places. We really think. And then something comes. Because the wise man built his house upon a, on a rock, right? But somehow we find some areas in which we're built on sand and we didn't even know it. And then things get turned upside down. And we're not so settled as we thought we were. Our families are not settled. Our marriages are not settled. Our churches are not settled. I know what we believe around here. I know what we're headed to do. If you've got any questions, just ask. If not, just listen for a while. If you haven't figured it out yet, yeah, you smile, Al. You've been around me for 20 years. I've been driving you nuts. If you don't know what's going on around here, get settled in. Jump on in, and you'll find out what's going on. You don't know what's in here? Read it. If you haven't figured out how to do it, ask somebody to disciple you. How do we do that? contact the office. We'll contact the people that are in charge. We'll make sure you get connected with somebody that will teach you. I tell you all the time. I'm not so subtle in some areas. I don't know if God really means that in there. I don't really know if God means that in there. Well, I'm going to tell you what. Paul dealt with it real quick. So let me give you about a 5-10 minute little history lesson. A little doctrinal lesson. And then let me give you a little bit of a practical application and we'll tie this thing together. First part, Paul has a wonderment of the believers. You say, why in the world would he be so wondering about the believers? Didn't Paul do a good enough job of discipling them? What kind of guy is this Paul guy? He starts a church, but they get all unsettled and disheveled, and they're, they're, out, they're out of whack, and they don't know what they're doing. They, they got things going. What? Well, that's why we have corrective teaching. The Bible says again, Scriptures given by inspiration of God, probable doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. All four pieces are needed. 
Some of you parents love to jump right over to correcting your kids and you not, have not taught them the doctrine of your home. You haven't taught them how to be reproved properly. You don't reprove or point out things properly with grace and love on what they've done wrong. You immediately go to the correction. Well, that's because we definitely have a problem with receiving correction. We don't like to be corrected, but God's word's there for us. Why? Because Paul shows us that he is marveling in amazement of what happened to the believers. He sees them being perverted. He sees them being troubled. What does it mean to trouble someone? To disturb or agitate. To pervert is to take and twist what is right and turn it into wrong or, or change it about. That's what the devil does in a way. We'll get to that in a little bit. But Paul's wonderment over the believers doing this. They abandoned the very grace of God that saved them back in Paul's first missionary journey. How is it that we abandon the very grace that saved us? Because we become unsettled. Because we become questioning over God. Why don't you question everything else but not question God? Let God be true in every what? They were man a liar. The grace of God is clear in this letter. It's found in verse, verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, verse 6, verse 15, verse 9, and 21 of chapter 2. It's found everywhere. Paul called them, excuse me, God called them and saved them. Now they're deserting God for human ways? Gosh. Boy, that's so surprising and shocking. Uh, no. Less than 40 days, Moses was alone with God. And they rejected all of God's truth and began to make a spiritual adultery against the one who saved them. That's found in Exodus 32. Judges chapter number 2, the Bible says that the nation of Israel quickly turned back to the way that they were in sin after all that they had in Joshua. Is it such a shock? Paul's wonderment of the believers, it shouldn't shock us. It's historical. The man would get everything from God that he needed, everything from the Lord Jesus Christ, everything from Paul the Apostle, everything from the church planting, and then go, eh, we're going to turn our backs on that, and now we're going to mix grace with works. You can't mix grace with works. No. The second thing I see in verses number 8 and 9, after seeing those words, perversion and trouble that go on there in verse number seven is that there's a reiteration and a double double-sided statement it's it's powerful it's like two sides of the same coin but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you that which we have preached unto you let him be a curse you know how serious god is when it's you know what a curse means damned nation it means you're damned that person preaches another gospel they're damned by god he says, you're accursed. If any man preach any other gospel unto you that ye have received, let him be accursed. The Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons. Yeah, I have compassion for those different people, the fact of their souls, but that movement is of the devil. They should be stinking damned for what they've done to lead people to hell. And there's a lot of other religions. Now, do I have compassion for the people? Yes, I do, for all of you. I was raised in a, in a, in a religion like that. That would damn me to hell. That would say, forget about you and your soul. Go to hell. And Paul's warning the believers. He's saying, don't let this happen, believers. Don't get pulled back into a works-based life when you've been saved by grace. You are supposed to be in a place in your life where you are a witness of God's manifold grace. Of his beautiful love for you. Of his unconditional, complete forgiveness. When you go to him in a repentant heart and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Search me, O God. Know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. Cleanse me, O God. That's the God that I know. That's the God of the Bible. That's the God that Paul's warning the believers to not turn away from. 
Because if you are any of those that preach another gospel, you're accursed. These Judaizers attempt to add Jewish ceremonial requirements to the gospel. Do you know that kind of movement's still going around? Do you know that's still happening? That today and the day that you live in, Judaizers are around with a movement to tell you that you need to keep the traditions of the old covenant in order for you to earn God's favor. I know it for a fact. I know people very close and very dear to me that have gone through it that still have had to battle their family heritage through it all. You see, this is real stuff, everybody. And you're not so settled. Oh, I know all that. Well, why is it you run from the opportunity to proclaim the goodness and the clarity of what God is saying here, just like Paul did to those people in Galatia? Verse number 10. Here's Paul's work ethic. Paul wants to make sure that you know all about his work ethic. Now, if you think about the way Paul goes about things, uh, and you see how his persistence, his diligence, his hard work, his proclamation of Jesus Christ and Jesus alone, but also to his heart that he is following the calling of God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who called him to the Gentiles. And yet he's being accused that he would favor the, the Gentiles with the gospel. See, Paul received a lot of false accusations. And he had to remind them of what his work ethic was how he operated, why he did what he did. And he says in verse number 10, For do I now persuade men or God? Are you thinking that I'm going to all of a sudden start persuading men instead of pleasing the Lord? Or do I seek to please men? It says in verse number 10, For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. No way. You see, Paul is saying something very strong here. He's setting himself apart according to the authority of Jesus, but also according to the authority of the gospel. He knows that he's an ambassador and he's a shepherd. He doesn't operate with an ulterior motive or an agenda. He's not a politician trying to make everybody happy about things. He's not sitting around going, okay, let me meet out a little favor you, a little favor to you. Let me move the gospel around to fit you. And let, let me say some words that are nice and tingling, tingly to your ears. No, no, no. His work ethic, work ethic to the believers is very clear. He's here not to persuade men or favor men, but rather to honor and glorify holy God. That's his work ethic. That ought to be your work ethic. That ought to be where you proclaim the way you set things up. So we come to a point here now for our message for the next few minutes where we want to take all that historical and doctrinal teaching and we want to bring it to a place of practical application. Now, what can this few verses, these five verses have for us? Remember, this theme this, for this book is justification by faith apart from the works of the law. That's what the theme is here in this corrective book. He said, okay, so what kind of correction can we get out of this? Well, I believe that we've got three things here. Let me show you the first one, and, and, and I want you to follow along here. The first one is that unsettled people, they believe the devil's perversions. Maybe some of the things you believe, you don't even know why you believe. You believe some things that you had no idea weren't even right. They're perversions. I did a series years ago with the, uh, the Awaken uh, uh, Sunday morning bunch, and uh, it was called Twisted Truth. Taking something that seemingly was right on the nose, and then you saw the twist that Satan had made in it. There's only one gospel we live in. That's the gospel of grace. Yes, Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. Yes, I know that. I know in Revelation 14, there's a glorious kingdom, I mean, a glorious gospel. I got that. But the gospel we're talking about is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of Christ. 
It is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the devil perverts that, he is messing with God's simple glory. It is powerful and it's mighty and it's clear. And if you think those perversions can't slip you up, there's all kinds of them around. Why don't you go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 with me and let's see what God has for us in terms of some proof text and help us to just kind of go, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. Oh, yeah, wait a minute. Well, pick up with me in verse number 10 of 1 Corinthians, excuse me, verse number 12 in 1 Corinthians 10. It says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Now, just, just pause for a minute there. Pause for a minute. Wherefore, let him thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You think you've got it all together, huh? Doctrinally, theologically, you're all set. Take heed where you stand that you may turn, get turned over because you may fall. Because the devil is very intricate in his perversions. Perversions are simply are what we are so readily drawn to, to believe that are just twisted things from truth. The Bible says in Strong's Concordance that it's to turn about to turn around, to turn one thing into another. That's what the meaning of perversion is, and it's done, as it says, passively. Verse number 13, then, some of you know this verse. What a tremendous verse. There had no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Unsettled people believe the devil's perversions. And when that happens, go back, go back. Don't get ahead of me there, bud. But when you see how the devil works in perverting things and twisting them and getting, getting us to a place where, oh, diversion tactic, look over here. Snuck one underneath you. Well, I've never been through the temptations that other people have been through because I've just handled things so much better than they, they have, and I, I'm never going to go through all that. No temptation is taking you, but such is common to man. Take heed, all of you. Take heed. Because it says, Whatever, whether, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. I'm concerned that that's where the church is at. I'm fine. I go to church. I learned the Bible back in the 70s and 80s and 90s. I'm good. I learned the Bible last month. I learned the Bible last year. I went to a Bible preaching message. I listened to some good preaching every once in a while. I listened to some good music. I'm good. But then, something happens. And then another thing happens. And then somebody starts saying something and preaching something and teaching something. And all of a sudden you're going, well, that sounds pretty good to me. That sounds really neat. In fact, you know what? That makes sense. Really? That makes sense. The only thing that makes sense is God. God's word. God's sense. That's what counteracts the devil. The devil is at it. The devil is messing with it. The devil has many, many perversions. And when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, you go, no temptation has taken me such as common to man. God is faithful enough to suffer me tempted. Oh yeah, God's given me escape hatches, but I continue to say no to them. And so I keep on getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Watch out. You won't just be unsettled. You'll be fallen by the wayside. And God will not be in a place where he'll be using you anymore because things have gotten so bad. It says in Romans chapter number 11, even so then, at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more of grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. That's Romans 11, 5 and 6. Keep in mind that it's about God's grace and about God's incredible, powerful gospel that we stand Unsettled people believe the devil's perversions. The next thing I want you to see here up on the screen is this. Unsettled people turn to the world's narrative. The narrative isn't the truth. The narrative is the commentary and the story of it. The narrative is given to you and me 
of someone's take or someone's interpretation of what's going on. The facts are the facts. The truth is the truth. But unsettled people oftentimes turn to the world's narrative. A narrative is a spoken or written account of connected events. It's a recited story according to interpretation. The world has plenty of versions, plenty of extra versions of Jesus Christ, extra goody versions or bad versions. The world has got so many different versions. They have different stories to tell about Jesus. They have different narratives to go with Jesus. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. This world is filled with a bunch of contradictory narratives, and they're not the truth. The truth is what we stand on. The truth is the Word of God. The truth is what the Bible says. I was taught a long time ago, I use this statement a lot, <clears throat> and I was taught it by some good men, a lot wiser than I am, and they said, look, if somebody gives you a question, and you have to give them an answer, then you open up the Bible and you say, this is what the Bible says. Right. Somebody asks you a question, this is what the word of the Lord says. Can I show you what the Bible says? No, 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 just give me, give me your thoughts. No, let me tell you what the Bible says. Right. And then you push it in front of me and you say, hey, let me have you read this verse. Well, I don't want to. I'll read it for you. I don't want to. Then I'm not going to answer your question. You understand? You see, we've been giving narratives to people for so long, we think we're experts. The world is fallen right in line because the world has been orchestrated and perpetuated by the great perverter. The devil has been given this world as his playground. The kingdoms of this world are at it against you, and you're just going, bah, 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 bah. wake up. Not this woke culture where we're trying to crush everything that is truth. You speak truth, you will hear about it. Good. Speak God's truth. Yes. Speak the word of God. Speak what God has to say. And you're perfectly covered and safe. You speak against the world's way by speaking what God's word says. Look at verse number 3, 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. But I fear lest any means, by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. Verse 4, For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if we, ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Hey, wake up. They're everywhere. I listen to this one on the blogs. I listen to this one on the messages. I listen. Why don't you just go listen to the Bible? Turn the Bible on. They got programs everywhere just to turn the Bible on and read it and study it. What does God say? Well, keep on going down. I think you can pick it up in the next verse, a little bit further, verse number 13. For such are false prophets, excuse me, false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And mar no marvel, here's no marvel, don't be surprised, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Do you know, do you understand what's at work here in the world you're living in? You cannot beat it. You cannot go up against it and defeat it. You need to stay really close to Jesus Christ. You need the Word of God. You need the Holy Spirit of God to grow you up, to fill you up, and to be armed and ready to go. Because this world has a narrative for you, and it's not the truth. Only one truth is what we stand on. We stand on the Word of God. And lastly, I want you to see, as Paul the Apostle shows us, in that verse, in, in Galatians chapter number 1, verse number 10, when we see what he speaks of there about himself, he says, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? Guess what? That's the issue here on the last one. When we put it up there, it says there, Unsettled people trust in self-reasoning. So this comes all to home as we finish up. 
There's only one master that we hold to, but I fear that many of God's people have become their own masters. I'm fearful that many people that are believers, Christians, have formed their narratives, have formed their doctrines, and they're following their ways. They have this little stew that they've made in the spiritual pot and oven of life. They put a little bit of God in there. They put a little bit of television show in there. They put a little bit of uh, Google looking up things. They put a little blog and Facebook in there. They stir it all up and go, blah, 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 blah. and now they get this stew filled with themselves. And it's all self reasoning. And people are trusting themselves. If you really think you should trust yourself to give advice to people without the word of God, you are a fool. Yeah, I said it. You're a fool. I'm a fool to think that I've got anything going on that's so stinking smart apart from the Word of God. You give somebody Bible direction. You give them Bible counsel. You give them not your, well, you know, I, I've sorted everything out. I have much wisdom. Well, ask Solomon how that went for him. Who is he a picture of? We're so full of ourselves. And none of you have more wisdom than Solomon. And Solomon fell. Solomon fell to this world and the woman of this world because he believed in himself. And then he made sure to tell us all in Ecclesiastes vanity and vexation of spirit. He wasted his life. There's only one master we hold to. But again, we fool ourselves. The devil's got perversions to fool us. The world's got stuff that's all twisted up in narratives for us to be fooled. And then we fool ourselves because we know the Bible. Oh, yes, we know the Bible. Well, the people that became the Judaizers of the day, they knew the Bible better than you would ever dream of. They knew the Old Testament, they knew the Old Covenant, and they brought it back and they said, guess what, the grace of God, <laughs> if you have not been circumcised as of the tribe and of the lineage of Moses, you're not saved. Can you imagine being told that? That's the extreme case, but today, my brothers and sisters in the Lord, in the 21st century on February 7th, the world is a ramping up. It is a tornado, a hurricane of noise. And if you go here to finish this up in Ephesians chapter number 6, I'll remind you how humbly Paul handled everything. And this is my encouragement as we finish out on how you handle things. It says in verse number 6 of Ephesians 6, Not with eye service as men's pleasers, but, but what? As the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to men, and not, excuse me, to the Lord and not to men. I wonder sometimes if that's our big slip up when it comes to self righteousness, self diagnosis, self spiritualism. We ignore the word of God, and then we go like they did in James chapter number 4. Ye adulterers and adulteress, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. We ask and receive not, because we ask amiss, that we may consume it upon our lusts unsettled people find themselves as the best counselor in their master. Church, my fellow believers, I encourage you to say, I cannot be settled in me. I cannot trust in me. I cannot put myself in a place where 
the perversions of Satan in the way he is, the narrative of this world, and me checking myself to see that my own reasoning can get me through is going to be the answer and the solution for that will keep you so unsettled. I have you look at this question as we go to our invitation time. Are you settled to live faith in the gospel without wavering and without wondering? All that money stuff, it's there. All the governmental stuff, it's there. But we need to be settled to live faith in the midst of this generation just simply on the gospel of the grace of God. Please bow your heads for a word.